welcome to this video lecture on PCR and the PTC lab that we'll be doing this week which will introduce you to the uh, powerful tool PCR that is a, a stalwart in the molecular biologist toolbox. So first of all what does PCR stand for? Uh, it stands for polymerase chain reaction. Polymerase should be pretty obvious since we're talking about uh, making multiple copies of DNA recently and chain reaction you'll see why it's referred to once we look at one of the animations. Its purpose, uh, pretty straightforward. It's used to amplify very specific stretches of DNA outside the cell. We've done uh, amplification by, by allowing cells to make multiple copies of plasmids for us, but this is a way to do it outside of the test tube, which will then eliminate the need to do an extraction or a mini prep, um, and is a very powerful uh, tool. Why would I need to use it? Well, if you wanted large copies of a certain gene for downstream applications, such as cloning, which we'll see in a couple weeks, uh, how we apply the PCR to that application, or it's also commonly used in the medical field to do diagnosis for uh, certain genetic conditions. If you have a sample and you need to amplify up uh, multiple copies of something so you can actually see it on a gel. Uh, PCR is the most common technique used to do, to do that. As far as who discovered it, the picture here on the slide here is of Dr. Kerry Mullis, who in 1983, when he worked for the Cetus Corporation out in California, actually dis came up with and discovered the process of PCR. Great book if you're looking for something to add to your summer reading pile uh, by Kerry Mullis, actually dancing naked in the minefield, which recounts his, uh, the story of him discovering the uh, PCR reaction. At this point, uh, what we need to do is figure out uh, what we need in order to perform PCR. In order to do that, what I want you to do now is pause the video and then go to this uh, URL and watch the animation there. That is a nice one that shows you the basics of PCR. And then when you come back here, we'll look at um, how this is going to apply for us as we go forward. All right, now, uh, if you watch that little animation, uh, we have to think about sort of what we're trying to do. Remember that our goal here is to copy a segment of DNA. If that's the case, uh, there are certain things we're going to need to have present. First thing, and most important thing, is the target DNA. What is it that you're trying to amplify or make copies of? This could be a, a disease gene. It could be a stretch of DNA that uh, you're using for some other purpose, but you need to have some target DNA. You also need to have, as you noticed in the animation, two what are known as primers, either referred to sometimes as the upstream and downstream primers, or the forward and reverse primers. Those are short little stretches of DNA that uh, you actually uh, either synthesize yourself or you can have made pretty easily from a number of companies online and, and shipped to you. Um, they need to be 15, 20, 25 base pairs long, long enough to uh, anneal to the DNA target. Um, and then we'll take advantage of the Watson-Crick complementary base pairing. We'll see more details about the primers uh, in a little bit. The other thing is you need tons of nucleotides. The A's, T's, G's, and C's are going to be used that are going to be used in the synthesis of the new DNA. So plenty of the nucleotides. And then the the um, perhaps one of the most important pieces uh, in the reaction is the polymerase. There's this very specific polymerase that's used known as TAC polymerase, comes from a, a, a bug, a bacterium, the therm Thermus aquaticus, which lives in the hot springs, that has a very, very stable polymerase, which allows us to heat it up to 95 degrees and not have it denature. So that's one of the key components of the PCR reaction that uh, is very was a novel discovery that we take advantage of in PCR. And you'll see why again in, as we look at this sequence of steps. Need to have the right buffer for the polymerase to function. Pretty standard, like we're used to doing any reactions with enzymes. We've got to make sure the pH and salt concentrations are right. And we're going to use what's known as a thermal cycler, which is basically a, um, a fancy water bath. It can heat up and cool down to very specific temperatures very rapidly and allow us to go through a number of different cycles uh, in the PCR reaction. All right, additional videos here. If you're still not sure, these are a couple great resources that show you the, the process of PCR. Um, the second one at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory is based on is, a, is an animation that I think is very uh, impressive that, that pulls together some of the uh, data that's been discovered recently about actual structure of some of these molecules involved. So you want to take a look at those. Uh, what steps are involved in the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR? Really, when it boils down to it, 
what we're talking about is uh, 30 or 40 cycles of really just three different steps, uh, which you will get used to hearing and saying pretty, pretty comfortably as we go through this a number of times. The first step is known as denaturing or melting of the DNA. And the DNA is, is held together by the um, hydrogen bonds between the nucleotides. We need to break those or unzip or denature the DNA. That's usually accomplished pretty easily by heating the sample for a minute up to 95 degrees centigrade. Now you can see why we have to have a, a enzyme that is very, very stable because 95 degrees is, is pretty hot and would denature most enzymes. The next step is with the annealing where the primers, which you can see here, these little short segments uh, that you had, had synthesized specific for your gene of interest, will anneal or stick to that single-stranded DNA very, at very specific locations, one upstream and then one downstream. Um, that is usually carried out for about 45 seconds to a minute at about 55 degrees or just below the what's known as the melting temperature of the primers. You'll learn more about those details as we get into primer design. You just need to know that it's down uh, a little bit below the temperature at which those primers will, will be able to anneal. And then we do a, an extension step, which is where the TAC polymerase is going to do its thing. Once the primers have attached both at, uh, at, the, up at one end and at the other end of the gene, um, the TAC polymerase will extend and add the new nucleotides and do the actual copying. That's done for 90 seconds or so at 72 degrees, which is the optimum temperature for the TAC polymerase. Depending on the length of the amplification target, you may go shorter than 90 seconds, may go longer than 90 seconds, depending on how big that stretch is that you're trying to replicate. So that, but basically, we're going to have three steps that get repeated over and over again. And using the, the exponential growth here, you double the number of copies of the gene you have every cycle. You can see um, 2 to the 30th power becomes a very, very large number pretty fast, since any one cycle here does not take all that long. So how is PCR relevant to your life? Well, we're going to take advantage of uh, some knowledge about a gene for uh, what's known as PTC, or phenylthiocarbamide testing, and whether you can taste it or not. It is genetically uh, determined or genetically, um, the gene for tasting is a genetic trait. Uh, there are two possible phenotypes based on uh, whether you can taste this molecule or not. It's a bitter compound, so that there's one possible phenotype where you are a taster, and you will know because it is a very bitter, nasty taste. Or if you're lucky, you're a non-taster, and when you uh, put the little strip of paper that has the PTC in it, you will not taste anything other than paper. So it will be um, very obvious when, you, when we check your phenotype by whether you can taste it or not. So now what I want to think about it, what if those are the two phenotypes, how many possible genotypes are there? Uh, if the taster allele we know is dominant, so I'll give you a second to think about that, what the possible genotypes would be for tasters or non-tasters. Hopefully most of you remembered from your Mendelian genetics that there's really three options. You could be big T, big T, which would be the homozygous dominant case where there would be a taster indicated by our buddy on the left there. Um, you could be heterozygous with big T, little t, which would still be a taster phenotypically, uh, but genotype would be different because it would have one large, uh, one dominant allele and one recessive allele. Or you could be the homozygous recessive little t, little t, which would be the non-taster indicated by the little girl in our picture here. So the PTC gene, what's the sequence? Well, what you can see here is the entire sequence of the PTC gene, which is about a little over, you know, a thousand base pairs long. Here are all the A's, T's, G's, and C's, written from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. What we're going to do is amplify a piece of this gene and see if we can take advantage of some interesting characteristics of the different uh, versions or the different alleles in order to determine your genotype. A couple things to note on here. Um, there's some things in, in colors. Uh, the red letters, the red bold letters, represent what are known as SNPs. SNP stands for Single Nucleotide Polymorphism. In other words, if we took all of the uh, DNA from all of us in class and, and looked at this specific gene, there are really only three areas that we have any variety that are known as SNPs, or single nucleotide differences. You can see them on the diagram, on the uh, sequence here. Here's one right up here, after about 140 base pairs in. There's another one down here, just after 781. 
and then a third one down here. Those three single differences um, lead to the two different alleles that we run into. There is a non-taster, which has what's known as the AVI allele, and that comes from the fact that the non-taster at those three locations that are, can differ have either have the G, T, and A, which are shown here, which lead to when the transcription and translation occur into producing alanine, valine, and isoleucine in the, in the protein, which hence why it's called the AVI allele for the alanine, valine, and isoleucine. The non, that's the non-taster, rather. The taster has uh, a different set of uh, nucleotides there. Instead of a G in the first location, it has a C. At the second one, instead of a T, it has a C. And at the third one, instead of an A, it has a G, which leads to three different amino acids in the protein, proline, alanine, and valine at those three locations, hence why it's referred to sometimes as the PAV allele for the first letter of those three amino acids. So those three differences are all that will make up the differences between any um, individual there. So what we're going to try to do is, is pluck those out and see if we can take advantage of that. So we look at the next slide. So what's so special about that region that we're going to have uh, flanked by the primers? If you look, remember back on this, you can see on here where we have the primers. Here's one primer binds here, and the other one binds down here. So as we look back at this site, here they are again. We've just zoomed in and gotten rid of some of the extra sequence information there. The thing of interest here is that between this primer and the one down here is actually one of those SNPs right in here. But you notice it happens to be very fortuitously right smack in the middle of a restriction site for a restriction enzyme known as FNU4H1, which means if you have the non-taster allele and you have a T in there, the restriction site disappears. If you have the taster allele, then instead of a T in there, you have a C, which makes the sequence G, C, T, G, C in that region right here, which is the actual restriction sequence for the FNU4H1 restriction enzyme. So that one single nucleotide difference we can find by looking for whether there's a restriction enzyme site there or not. So we're going to be amplifying up only a segment between those two um, primers, but that flank that very important region of the FNU4H1 site, which has right smack in the middle of it one of those SNPs. How do we design the primers? Give you a quickie uh, here about explaining it, but then we'll go into more detail as we learn more about it. That forward primer, you see here's the sequence um, indicated right here from 5 prime to 3 prime. You notice that matches exactly with the sequence right up here in the gene. So that if we had a stretch of DNA, that forward primer, it would match a complementary base pair with the complementary strand to what we have written here and would stick uh, to one strand of the DNA. Now, as you know from the videos that we just watched on, the, on PCR, we need to have the other primer actually stick to the other strand, the complementary strand. So designing the reverse primer, uh, this one here, is a little bit more complicated because it's not simply the sequence written here because the 5 primed end to 3 primed end has to go in the other direction and be to the other strand. So where you see at the end of the primer um, the, all these T's, those will actually stick complementary to up here where the A's were. Uh, again, it's a little confusing at first, but we'll get into more details on how to design primers, which you're going to have to do later on in the term when we do a, a project where we're going to have to clone up a specific gene. So that's a little bit on the primer design. So what happens after we do PCR? We amplify up that uh, little stretch between the two primers. We digest it with the FNU4H1. And then there would be a difference if a non-taster or a taster, because uh, we know that they have a very different genotype that we talked about earlier. Then we would run a gel and do what's known as an RFLP, or a RIFLIP analysis. RFLP stands for Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism. Fancy way of saying that when you chop up the DNA from the different alleles, they will have different size pieces, restriction fragments, uh, 
polymorphism, different forms. So if we can see the different forms on a gel we're do and identify which allele it came from, we're doing what's known as a RIFLIP analysis or RFLP analysis. Fancy way of saying running the gel and basically figuring out what's going on. So if we think of what we're going to do, because these are going to be pretty small pieces, the actually piece we're amplifying is 303 base pairs long, so we're going to have to run it on a little stiffer gel. We'll use a 2% agarose gel, and we'll run a different size ladder. We'll use a 100 base pair ladder. So what we will do is we'll put our 100 base pair ladder in one lane, and you will see the, there are a couple identifying bands in here. There is one bright one at the 1,000 and another one at 500. So that gives you some, you might want to write those down on the side there. The 500 base pair piece is this one in the middle and 1,000 up higher. So if we ran a non-taster, remember that the non-taster should have how many bands? Well, it should only have one band because the non-taster allele did not have that restriction site. So the non-taster, which is little t, little t, should only have one band at about 303 base pairs, which would be right down around here. Right? If we had the taster, which does have the restriction site present, and there's two copies of the same thing, we should only end up with how many bands? Shouldn't be too hard to figure out. We should have two. There's in the, because of where the restriction site is, we'll get two bands, one of them at about 238 base pairs, and the other one at about 64. Now we may not even be able to see the 64 base pair piece, uh, because as you know, those pieces are tough to see on the gel. But that shouldn't matter once we see what will happen with um, the other option. In lane 4, if we have a taster who is heterozygous, has a big T and a little t, we should actually see how many bands? Well, we should see all three, because they will have one band that comes from the little t, which is not going to be able to be cut, and then another band, two bands, the bottom two, which would come from the big T allele, which does have the restriction site. So again, we should remind ourselves the non-taster, we should have, which is little t, little t, one band at 303 base pairs. The taster, if it's big T, big T, we're going to have two bands, 238 and 64. If it is big T, little t, we're actually going to get all three bands. Now again, the 64 band, base pair band may be too small to see, but if these aren't here, we still have an area in this part of the gel that gives us three very distinct banding patterns on the gel that we should be able to interpret and figure out what your genotype actually is. So that's it for this little video lecture. Uh, make sure to watch those animations and read the lab sheet before coming to lab. Thanks.